Quiet, please. Quiet, please. Broadcasting System presents Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper and which features Ernest Chappell. Quiet, Please, for tonight is called Whence Came You? I came from Jerusalem. I've traveled in the East a good deal in the last 20-odd years, and I flatter myself that I know my way around. So when I got off the plane at Cairo, I didn't start for the camp right away as a good storybook archaeologist would have done. I made a beeline for Shepherds in the room I'd left a couple of days before when I went to Jerusalem. A bath, a gin and tonic, and a large batch of mail from the States. <laughs> what more can a man ask? In Cairo on a hot night? But of course it was too good to last. I'm just going to let him knock. Hey, Austin, wake up. Oh, who the... Hey, it's Abe Feldman. Abe Feldman? Hey! Hi, Austin. <laughs> Regards from State and Madison. Well, I'll be darned. Come <laughs> on here. What are you doing here? <laughs> what do you got there? I do get around, don't I? <laughs> this, is, this is gin and tonic. How are you? Well, I'm fine, but come in. <laughs> well, sit down. You're the last man in the world that I... Here, take a gin and tonic before I drop it. <laughs> Well, Lachaim. Lachaim and spades, Abe. <sighs> By golly, I'm glad to see you, boy. I'm glad to see you. I've been looking here for three days waiting for you to come back. Hey, you look skinnier. Will you go out and dig holes out there for six months, lad? You'll take off some of that fat, too. <laughs> Me fat? <laughs> go away, you're kidding. Well, get your shirt on and let's go see the town. Sit down. <laughs> come on, what you doing here? <sighs> business. Yeah, what kind of business? Newspaper business, Natch. What's cooking in the Middle East and stuff? Ah, say, uh, how do you get more of these things? We'll get on the bar in a minute. They're colder down there. Well, go on, go on. Tell me about it. Well, you know, Eddie Heffercamp just called me in and said, draw some dough and go east and send up some stuff for the Sunday feature section. The trip's making a monkey out of us again. So I remember the dear old days on the Midway, you and me, and you're around here, so... Let's go see the town, huh? Well, I'll be darned. <laughs> when did you leave Chicago? Day before yesterday. Oh, boy. Yep, the loop's still there. They still got the Burley Q shows on South State Street. The Michigan Avenue Bridge is always up. The Cubs are in seventh place. Now? Now what? Now we go see the town? Come on, put on your pants. <laughs> You've never been in Cairo before, have you? Me? <laughs> Not me, why? Well, if you had, you wouldn't care much about seeing it, my boy. Yeah? Yeah. But, uh, women... You had a good look at any of them? <laughs> Have I? Oh, boy. <laughs> what? <laughs> the one that's waiting for you downstairs. Waiting for me? Wow. What are you talking about? I don't know any women in Cairo. Well, there's one who knows you. Why, you're crazy. I'm telling you. How do you know? She's been waiting down there for three days. I've seen her. What's she look like? Oh, boy. Not a native. Cleopatra. Is this one of your bum jokes, Abe? I give you my word of honor. I don't get it. Come on downstairs and you will. So we went downstairs. British colonels, American traveling salesmen, Egyptian army officers. A thief or two, a bevy of the ugliest women in the world. And I don't see any woman waiting for me. There. By the door to the bar. And I looked. And there by the door stood the one most beautiful woman I have ever seen in all my life. She was no Egyptian native. She might have descended from one of the marvelously lifelike paintings of a queen of the Hathor dynasty that I've seen on the walls of tombs 2,000 years old. How can I describe her? Her eyes were black. Her hair was black and cut 
in the manner of the days of the shepherd kings that ruled the valley of the Nile a thousand years before the pyramids were built. Red lips that smiled at me slowly. I felt my knees tremble as she looked into my eyes. Come on, let's go ask her if she's got a friend. And when I looked back at her... Where'd she go? It was midnight, and then one o'clock, and two, and then three. We still walked the streets of Cairo. And the waning moon was rising in the northeast behind our shoulders as we turned our steps back to the hotel. Twice I thought I'd seen her, and twice she, if she it was, disappeared into a narrow winding street where we couldn't follow. No, I... Never followed women about the streets of a foreign city before, not in all my life. Well, there's little enough of that in the life of an archaeologist. The women we followed died a thousand, ten thousand years before we were born. We know them only by their portraits painted on the walls of a musty tomb. By what we find in great hermetically sealed stone caskets, wrapped in rust-colored linen and smelling of the ghost of cinnamon and myrrh and spikenard. I don't know why I did this. I know. She wanted you to come after her. Well, that's ridiculous, Abe. I heard her ask for you. Well, what would she want of me? <laughs> what does a pretty gal usually want of a guy? Drinks, something to eat, a good time? Well, she could have had that from anybody. Yeah, me, for instance. But she wanted you, Austin. Well, why? Maybe she's a spy or something. A spy? Maybe she wanted to sell you something. You know, you grave robbers... Maybe she knows where some old pharaoh or somebody is planted. Yeah, that could be, I suppose. Yeah, well, I'm for bed. I got to get out to the diggings early. Fine night we had. Yeah, forget it. You got a room, huh? Yeah, right down the hall. Well, knock on my door when you get up. All right. Good night. Night. Say, they uh, have this incense all the time around this place, huh? What do you mean? Don't you smell it? Smells like a funeral. I don't... Oh. Yeah, I suppose. Night. Night, Austin. I could have told him what the... incense was. I've smelled cinnamon and myrrh and spikenard too often not to recognize it instantly. When I opened the door to my room, the smell was almost overpowering, used as I am to the funeral spices of ancient Egyptian tombs. No. No, I'm not going to tell you what a, that a beautiful Egyptian princess of the days of Hyksos was waiting for me in the darkness. This isn't a ghost story. It's a true story. There wasn't anyone in the room. I turned on the lights... Opened the window. There wasn't anyone in the room. So I went to bed, dreamed about sailing on Lake Michigan. The storm came up and the thunder crashed. And I was scared to death. And then I woke up and the thunder was the servant knocking on my door, bringing me my morning cup of tea. Abe and I got in my jeep and rode out to the excavation. It's quite a distance from Cairo. But never mind just where it is, because that's my business. And the universities. That right rear tire went flat, just as I've been expecting. I forgot to put air in a spare, so we took quite a while getting it pumped up. It was late afternoon when we got there. Abe had never seen anything of this sort. You see, Abe, these places are built one on top of another. Almost every village and town in the east is. Mm, different periods of time, huh? Yeah, that's right. There may be any number of cities built above the ruins of another. All we do is dig out the top when you see, recover everything we can that's of historical importance, then go on carefully down to the next. What do you do with the stuff that's on top? It has to be destroyed, naturally. Mm, gee, that's too bad, ain't it? Well, we make careful records, photographs. And then you just... Peel off the stuff and go on to the next. That's right. This is the fourth city from the top we're working on now. Uh, see those big, that big pile of rubble over there? Yeah. That's the remains of the other three cities. 
Gee, that seems a shame. All those years of work and living and everything. Well, we save artifacts, of course. Uh, save what? You no, know, uh, things that people made. Pot shards, fragments of wall paintings, decorations, that sort of thing. Uh, what do you do with the people you find? People? Yeah. Oh, mummies. Uh, various things. We read the inscriptions. Decide whether the fellow was important enough to investigate further. The Egyptian government has a great deal to say about the contents of tombs, you know. Uh, find any gold? Not here so far, but we probably will. This part where we're standing was the necropolis of this particular city. Uh-huh. The cemetery, you see. Oh, yeah. It's reasonable to suppose that there are other tombs under here. That's where you find the jewels and the golden stuff? Mm, generally, yes. Uh, say, Austin, why don't you get a steam shovel in here? You'd move this stuff a lot quicker. And probably smash some priceless inscriptions or paintings into bits. No, my boy, we do this gently. Uh-huh. And you can read this stuff, huh? The hieroglyphics? Hieroglyphics comes from two Greek words originally meaning carving by priests. Okay, Professor. Can you read it? Yeah, of course. I can read a good deal of the later writings by sight when we get down to the real ancient stuff. That's a little more difficult. Uh, what does this say? What? Uh, this slab here. Yeah, let's see. Uh... Here was I, Hotep, presented with a, well, I guess you'd say invested with, the working tools of those who build. In my hand, I, Hotep, did take, uh, took, the tools of the second uh, grade of workmen in stone, the... Uh, Plum, the square, and the... The level, huh? How'd you know? There were masons in those days. Well, sure. How do you think they built all this stone stuff? Hey, look at that. What's that there? Uh, it's a name. Uh, Sholem. Uh, it's probably Solomon. Yeah, this was in Solomon's time. Uh, right alongside the name. The middle stone of an arch, which is... Secret. The keystone. These fellows didn't know how to build an arch. Well, that's right, they didn't. Why are you so excited about it, though? Hey. What? Uh, look at that. This? Yeah, that's a very fine example of wall painting. Look how the colors are still bright. Look how they. Yeah. You see the same thing I see, don't you? You know what I saw. You know whose portrait was painted on the edge of the slab that came from a tomb that was old in the time of Augustus Caesar. Coincidence or not, here was the face of the woman who waited for me the night before in Shepherd's Hotel. It's amazing how racial characteristics persist through centuries in Egypt. I have seen Egyptian men who might have been Tutankhamun's own brother. I've seen women, but, but you wouldn't blame me for feeling my hackles rise a little at this uncanny resemblance to the woman who disappeared. I kept smelling myrrh and spikenard and cinnamon. But I hadn't much time to think of it then. Martin Weaver, who was in charge of the actual excavation, came up behind us. Well, I'm glad you're back, Orson. Oh, hello, Martin. How are we doing? Uh, Dave Felden, Martin Weaver. Oh, yeah. Hello. Well, day before yesterday, we broke through a place, Austin, that goes down to the city underneath this one. You did? Yeah, one of the workmen found a big sandstone slab, and we cleared it away completely. I've got the big shears rigged over it now, and I thought we'd wait till you got here to lift the slab. Um... Uh, you want to do it tonight or what? Oh, gosh, let's do it now, Austin. Well, what do you think? It's getting dark. Let's have a look at it. Okay. Well, I'm glad you're back. Uh, bring anything to drink with you? We walked half a mile. There was a little clearing at one corner of the necropolis, and the beams of the shears stood stark against the darkening sky. There was something elemental, something deathly about them. It's not an archaeologist's job to be 
sentimental or superstitious. None of us would stay on the job very long if we were. But the half-inch steel cable was attached to a block of stone was the only thing that separated us from something that happened perhaps 40 centuries ago. And, well, there are times when a man's entitled to shiver a little in the wind that rises over the desert at sunset. Abe was beside himself with excitement. Let's pull it up, Austin. Go on and let's pull it up, huh? Go ahead, Martin. Okay. Glad we got the engine. That slab weighs about 70 tons. Go ahead. A little higher. Gosh! <coughs> the air from down there. <coughs> that air you're breathing, Abe, was breathed by pharaohs long before Moses let his people out of this country. Gee. Okay, hold it, Martin. Right. Uh, you, you going down there, Austin? Tomorrow. Oh, not now. No, no, it's late. Oh, gee, I'd like to go down there. We will in the morning. Uh, how is it? Let's take your flashlight. Yeah. Hmm? yeah. Mummy case, some wall paintings. Let me see. Take the flashlight. Oh, boy, oh, boy. It, it isn't far down there. I'm going to jump down. No, 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 wait. Don't do that. I'll be all right. Now, don't go running all over that place, tracking it up, Abe. I won't, boy. It's dark down here. Get a ladder, Martin. Yeah, okay. You hear me, Abe? I hear you. Throw me your flashlight. Oh, gone it. That's the last time you... Here. Now, stand still. I'm standing still. Hey, Austin. What? There's a picture on the wall. What picture? Over here on the wall. Oh, darn it. I dropped the light. Well, stand still. Martin will be back in a minute with his light. Austin. What? There's something in here. Well, be careful. It might be a snake. No, it, it ain't a snake. It is. Ah! Abe. Abe. Abe, what happened? Look out, Austin. Look out the slab. <laughs> all night long, Martin and I, splicing that steel cable and raising the heavy slab that had imprisoned Abe in that place of the dead. We had no hope, but what could we do? A miracle might have happened. There might have been a chink between the slab and the opening it covered, an opening through which a few breaths of air might have seeped into the tomb. The snake might not have bitten him. He might have killed it. So we told each other all through the night, and the stubborn cable cut our hands and defied our every effort. The sun was just rising when we at last had made it fast, and Martin started the engine. We fastened the rope onto the cable, and we swung the great stone slab aside. I was down in the tomb almost before it had cleared the opening. It was too late. I nearly sickened as I called to Martin. He jumped down, too. Oh, my good... What happened to him? I thought it was a snake. No snake did that. No. I saw a pigeon once that a hawk had been at. We... We'd have been too late even if the slab hadn't fallen. Well... Austin. What? That mummy case. Was the cover off it last night when you looked down here? No. Why, Abe couldn't have... That... Lid weighs ten tons. Then we looked down into the stone coffin. I hope I shall never see the like of that again. Look. What is it? The mummy of a man. A tall man. In a robe of gold cloth. Not wrapped in linen bindings. Just a robe of gold cloth with strange symbols woven into the cloth. And his head. Not a man's head. The head of a hawk. No, not a mask. We look carefully. A man with a head of a hawk. And the hawk's beak. All dabbled with red. I didn't believe it either. It couldn't be. 
But it was. It was the father of all the Egyptian gods, Osiris. Osiris, the brother-husband of Isis, the founder of the world's first empire. Osiris, who was murdered 16,000 years ago. And whose body was hidden by Isis, his wife, with a blasting curse on any who might find his tomb. It was impossible. It couldn't be. But there it was. And Martin and I and a dead man were there in his tomb with him. And the curse hung heavy in the musty air around us. And then the first rays of the sun reflected from something above us stole down into the tomb. And I saw the pictures on the wall. I saw Osiris with his hawk's head. And the robe he wore and the mitre on his hawk's head was the same that the mummy wore in a casket. I saw Isis, his wife, weeping over the body of her murdered husband. And the beauty of the work of the long dead artist was unbelievable. And I saw another picture. There was the daughter of Isis and Osiris. Yes. Yes, of course I could read the inscriptions. Yes. Of course I could recognize her face. I'd seen it before. In the lobby of Shepherd's Hotel. And the inscriptions on the wall were terrifying. There were secrets there that men would give their lives to possess today. There were secrets there that we've only begun to imagine today. I'm a scientist, I know. Or do I? We forgot the thing in the coffin. We, we forgot the thing on the floor. And it grew darker and darker in the tomb. And I read on and on. I stood before the painting of the one who was Osiris' daughter. Long black hair. Red lips that smiled at me. And my heart stopped at the inscription under the portrait. I read it over again. Be not afraid. Ah, Us Tin. Carved into the living rock in the ancient heretic characters uncounted centuries ago. Not by the hand of the artist. I knew who had carved my name there. Be not afraid, Austin. And I wasn't afraid at all when I discovered that the thing that was making it dark down there was a great slab of sandstone slowly swinging around and down to imprison us all in the tomb that the wife of Osiris had cursed. Martin Weaver was a very brave man. Martin Weaver didn't scream and cry in the heavy dark. Martin Weaver talked to me quietly. It'll be all right, Austin. The workmen will be here before long and they'll see the slab and... Ibrahim knows how to run the engine. I hope so, Martin. I hope they'll be in time. They'll be in time. He'll start the engine and pull the thing off. All right. I hope so, Martin. Sure. They'll know that something's wrong. Where are you? Right here. Well, stand still. I am standing still. I thought I heard you move. No. No. You afraid, Austin? Are you? Not particularly. But I... Yes. Well, the thing in the... Where are you going? I haven't moved. I thought I felt your hand on my arm. No. Sit still. Don't use up the air. Well, you sit still. I tell you, I didn't move. Something's moving. It couldn't be. Austin? What? <sighs> Martin. Martin! 
Martin! Answer me, Martin! And there was nothing but silence. And then another footstep. And I felt a hand on my arm and I screamed with terror. But it was a gentle hand and it led me gently away from where I stood in the dark. And I followed. I hit my head on a solid stone wall. My feet dragged as I followed whoever it was through a door that I knew couldn't be there. And a voice breathed in my ear. Austin. And I smelled cinnamon and myrrh and spike and heart. And I followed on. And soon there was a glimmering of light ahead of me and I felt the hand release my arm. And I walked on toward the light. Then, in a little while, another little room hewn out of the solid rock. And a light burning. A little bronze lamp at the head of a mummy case of lacquered painted wood. And the portrait image on the lid of the sarcophagus. The same face. The smile. And I came closer to read the inscription I knew would be there. An inscription put there so many, many years ago. I have freed you, Austin. Now free me. My hand went to the fastening of the lid. When I looked up to the wall above, the portrait again, but with a difference. The same costume, the same jewelry, the same headdress. But the head was the head of a hawk, the head of Osiris' daughter. So I sit here, and the little bronze lamp is flickering low. No, I haven't opened the coffin. I'm afraid to. Listen to Quiet, Please, which is written and directed by Willis Cooper. The man who spoke to you was Ernest Chappell. And Murray Forbes played Abe Feldman. Martin Weaver was Don Briggs. As usual, the original music for Quiet, Please is composed and played by Albert Berman. Now for a word about next week's Quiet, Please. Here is my good friend, our writer-director... Willis Cooper. I've got a story for you next week called Put on the Dead Man's Coat. It's about a man who had an idea that wasn't good for him. Put on the Dead Man's Coat. The title of next week's Quiet, Please. And so until next week at this time, I am quietly yours... Ernest Chapel. Quiet, please, comes to you from New York. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System.